Over 20 years ago, Concorde made its final landing, and with it, supersonic passenger travel disappeared. This was a plane that cruised at Mach 2, flew at 60,000 feet and could cross the Atlantic in just three and a half hours. Nothing since has matched it. So what happened? Why did airlines walk away from a jet that actually worked? Was it the fuel costs, the insane maintenance, or was Concorde just too far ahead of its time? Because the Concorde wasn't just fast, it was experimental, expensive, politically loaded. And in today's video, we're diving deep into how engineering brilliance met harsh reality and why no airline has brought it back. In a few years' time, the sight of Concorde on international airfields all over the world will be commonplace if all goes well. In the world of commercial aviation, few aircraft have ever pushed the boundaries like the Concorde, and not just because of the speed. This jet wasn't an iteration of an earlier airframe. It wasn't a slightly upgraded fuselage or a marginally better engine. It was a full-on engineering moonshot, built from the ground up for one thing, to go faster than the speed of sound, and then keep going. Cruising at Mach 2.04, the Concorde could fly from London to New York in just under 3 hours and 30 minutes. That's faster than the rotation of the Earth itself at the equator. Its service ceiling of 60,000 feet meant passengers could literally see the curvature of the planet. But for engineers, the real marvel wasn't just the altitude or the speed. It was how the aircraft managed to stay controllable at both low and high speeds using the same airframe. Let's start with the airframe. The Concorde featured a slender delta wing, one of the few aerodynamic shapes that could manage both supersonic cruise and subsonic takeoff and landing. Unlike conventional swept wings, the delta wing allowed for lower drag at high speeds, but came with a price, high landing speeds and poor lift at lower speeds. To compensate, engineers took advantage of something called vortex lift a phenomenon where airflow over the sharply swept wing creates stable vortices, increasing lift during slower flight phases. This allowed the Concorde to take off and land at airports like JFK and Heathrow, despite its supersonic DNA. But the wings were just the beginning. Propelling the Concorde were four Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus, 593 turbojet engines descendants of military bomber engines now reworked for civil aviation. Each one produced 38,050 pounds of thrust, and more importantly, they featured afterburners, a rarity in commercial aviation. These afterburners, or reheat systems, injected fuel into the exhaust stream to increase thrust during takeoff and the transonic climb through the sound barrier. This wasn't just a gimmick at all, but it was a requirement. Without reheat, the Concorde would have never had the acceleration needed to push through the drag wall around Mach 0.95 to Mach 1.2. Now, here's where the engineering gets even more impressive. Once the aircraft reached supersonic cruise, the afterburners were shut off to conserve fuel. But managing the airflow at Mach 2 is no small task. That's where variable geometry intake ramps came into play. These ramps automatically adjusted to slow down and compress incoming air before it reached the engines. At Mach 2, unregulated airflow would destroy the turbines, so the intake system had to deliver subsonic airflow to a supersonic engine, in real time, at 60,000 feet. Think about that. Concorde wasn't just a fast jet. It was a computer-controlled supersonic airflow lab that worked in dynamic conditions every time it flew. Even fuel tanks weren't simple. Concorde's center of gravity shifted as it accelerated to cruise speed due to aerodynamic heating, which caused the fuselage to expand by as much as 10 inches. Engineers solved this by using active fuel transfer systems, shifting fuel between tanks in the wings and tail to maintain stability. It's a solution you don't see in any other commercial jet. And of course, there's the nose. Concorde's drooped nose wasn't just iconic, but it was essential. The sharply angled cockpit and long nose were aerodynamically efficient at Mach 2, but they created terrible forward visibility at takeoff and landing. The solution? A hydraulically actuated drooping nose cone with a movable visor, 
giving pilots full visibility on the runway while keeping the aerodynamics intact in flight. And all of this tech worked. For nearly 30 years, Concorde operated over the Atlantic without a single passenger fatality from technical failure. In terms of reliability, it was more consistent than many subsonic jets. So why did it vanish? It wasn't because the Concorde failed to perform. It was because the design that made it an engineering marvel also made it nearly impossible to scale. From its fuel efficiency, operating costs, and maintenance demands, to political resistance and environmental concerns, Concorde was a product of a very specific era. Technically brilliant, but economically fragile. And that brings us to the real question. With all the progress we've made in aerospace, why hasn't anyone replicated it? Because, as we'll explore next, the downfall of Concorde wasn't about one thing. It was a perfect storm of economic miscalculations, political shifts, and public perception. And that's what killed the future of supersonic travel. Before we move on, if you've been enjoying the deep dive so far, consider hitting that subscribe button. It's free, and it helps us keep making aviation stories like this. Next, let's look at the cracks in the business case that grounded supersonic travel before it ever had a chance to scale. For all of Concorde's technical brilliance, the real story of its downfall was written in the spreadsheets. From day one, the economics didn't make sense, and to understand why, you have to look at how the aircraft was actually used, not just how it flew. Let's start with the number that haunts every supersonic dream, 100 seats. That's all Concorde could carry, roughly half of what a Boeing 737 fits today. And even those 100 seats weren't all that flexible. The cabin was narrow, and fuel tanks occupied the space where extra rows or cargo would go on a subsonic aircraft. There was no business class, no economy, just one ultra-premium experience and one ultra-premium price. Now compare that to what it cost to fly Concorde. On average, each round trip from London to New York burned around 50,000 liters of fuel, double that of a subsonic airliner flying the same route. That's with fewer passengers, no cargo, and higher maintenance demands due to the extreme stress the aircraft endured on every flight. The Rolls-Royce slash Snecma Olympus 593 turbojet engines were engineering marvels, yes. but they were built for thrust, not efficiency. These were pure turbojets, optimized for sustained supersonic crews, not cost-saving at altitude. There was no bypass air like on modern high-bypass turbofans, which meant fuel was burned aggressively just to maintain Mach 2.04, and the numbers kept stacking against it. In the early days, a Concorde ticket might cost $12,000 round trip in today's money. That sounds outrageous. But even at those prices, the margins were razor thin. British Airways and Air France, which operated the plane, were effectively subsidizing each flight for years. It wasn't until British Airways figured out that business travelers would pay more for exclusivity than just speed that they began turning a profit. But by then, public opinion had started to shift. There's another number worth noting. 14. That's how many Concords were ever delivered to commercial operators. 14 aircraft. No other airline outside the UK or France ever received one. Why? Because the political deal that built Concorde also limited its reach. This wasn't a global commercial product. It was a joint venture between two governments, part Cold War prestige project, part industrial experiment. Boeing had tried its own supersonic jet, the 2707, but it was canceled in the early 70s. The US Congress pulled the funding after noise concerns and ballooning costs. Concorde survived, but barely. The U.S. also refused to let Concorde land at most of its airports for years. The FAA cited concerns over noise, especially from its sonic boom during transcontinental flights. Public outcry in cities like Washington, D.C. and New York made matters worse. Eventually, Concorde was granted access to JFK under very strict limitations. That's one of the reasons it only ever flew certain routes. London, New York, Paris, New York, and a few occasional charters. Sonic booms were a major problem. When Concorde crossed Mach 1 over land, it created a shockwave that hit the ground like thunder. 
Unlike military jets that could limit boom exposure in combat zones, Concorde was a daily scheduled service. The US, Canada, India, and others all imposed overland supersonic flight bans that severely restricted its commercial viability. It could only accelerate once it was over the ocean. In other words, speed was geographically limited. The very thing Concorde was built for, faster flight, was restricted by law over most of the world. The operational costs didn't help either. Just maintaining the aircraft required a dedicated, specialized team. Heat expansion during flight meant Concorde grew by nearly 10 inches mid-cruise. That meant tighter tolerances, more inspections, and more downtime between flights. Its slender delta wing, essential for high-speed performance, made low-speed handling difficult. Takeoff and landing required steep angles of attack and careful pilot technique. Add to that the fact that every engine start, fuel transfer, and trim adjustment had to be managed with care. Concorde was manually intensive. There were no full authority digital engine control systems like we see today. Everything was monitored by the flight engineer using analog instruments. So when airlines crunched the numbers, the conclusion was clear. Concorde wasn't a fleet aircraft. It was a halo product, an icon. Great for marketing, terrible for scaling. And that's exactly why no other carrier outside of Air France and British Airways ever committed to it. But here's the twist. For passengers, Concorde wasn't a failure at all. It had a stellar safety record, zero fatalities in commercial service for over 25 years. It worked. It was reliable. It had a dispatch rate that rivaled most subsonic jets of its era. The public loved it. But in aviation, love doesn't keep aircraft flying. Profit does. And after the crash in 2000 and the subsequent dip in demand post 9-11, it was clear that even prestige routes couldn't justify the operating costs anymore. All right, coming up next, we're heading into the final chapter. What killed Concord for good and why no one, not even Boom Supersonic has, has truly solved the core problems. Concorde didn't die because it failed as an aircraft. It died because the world around it changed faster than it could keep up. And on July 25th, 2000, everything caught up with it. Air France Flight 4590 was fully loaded, ready to depart from Charles de Gaulle to New York. But as it accelerated down the runway, it ran over a titanium strip that had fallen off a Continental DC-10. That one metal piece caused a chain reaction that led to Concorde's left side tires bursting. Fragments of rubber punctured the left wing. Inside the wing, the shockwave ruptured a fuel tank. Fuel started gushing out. At nearly 200 miles per hour, flames trailed behind the aircraft. Despite a desperate attempt to climb out, the left engine caught fire, and then the right. Concorde became uncontrollable and crashed into a hotel just two minutes after takeoff. 113 people died, 100 passengers, nine crew, and four on the ground. It wasn't a design flaw in the Concorde itself, it was a freak accident. But the optics were brutal. This was the first fatal crash in the aircraft's 27-year history, and it happened in front of the world's cameras. The crash forced regulators to ground the Concorde fleet immediately. Engineers went to work modifying the tires, adding Kevlar lining to the fuel tanks, and reinforcing wire bundles. And just 16 months later, in November 2001, Concorde took to the skies again. But the world it returned to wasn't the one it left. Because while the Concorde was being modified on the ground, 9-11 happened. Air travel was hit harder than at any point in modern history. Demand for transatlantic business flights collapsed. Airports tightened security. Airlines slashed costs. And here was Concord, still burning tons of fuel, still requiring hours of maintenance for every few hours in the air, and still flying a niche route for a niche market. It didn't stand a chance. Air France and British Airways both quietly announced retirement plans in 2003. Not because the plane was unsafe, but because it was no longer viable. The economics had finally won. So let's break that down. First, fuel. Concorde burned more than 6,700 gallons per hour, more than four times what a 747 consumed per passenger. Jet A1 wasn't cheap, 
and every oil price spike cut deeper into Concorde's margins. Second, maintenance. The Olympus 593 engines needed constant attention. Each variable intake ramp and afterburner had to be inspected and fine-tuned. The Delta Wing's high-stress design added further load cycles per flight. And because the fleet was small, just 14 aircraft in active service, maintenance costs couldn't be spread out like they could with a 747 or A330. Third, regulations. Even before the crash, Concorde had been banned over land routes due to sonic booms. Supersonic cruise was limited to transoceanic routes, meaning Concorde was stuck flying the North Atlantic Corridor. That was it. Finally, public perception. After the crash, after September 11th, the world was more cautious. The jet age had moved towards safety, sustainability, and volume. And in that new era, a loud, expensive, fuel-hungry status symbol had no place. But still, no aircraft has matched what Concorde did in the air. Boom Supersonic says it will. Their Overture jet promises Mach 1.7 crews with net zero emissions. NASA and Lockheed Martin are testing the X-59 with a new quiet boom design that may allow supersonic flight over land. But none of those aircraft are flying passengers yet. And even if they do, they'll still face the same questions Concord never escaped. Can it be profitable? Can it be quiet? Can it scale? In the end, Concorde wasn't beaten by another plane. It was beaten by reality. A reality where speed mattered less than cost, where margins mattered more than Mach numbers, and where the future of aviation turned subsonic by design. And yet, even now, two decades later, people still talk about Concorde in a way they talk about Titanic, because it didn't just fly faster, it symbolized the possibility of what could happen when engineering defied expectations, even if just for a moment. So, will we ever see another Concorde? Technically? Maybe. Economically? Not yet. But the legacy it left behind still shapes how we dream about flight. In the end, Concorde wasn't just fast. It was a statement of what engineering could do when the limits were pushed, of how far we could go, and how quickly. But it also showed us something else, that just because something can be built doesn't mean it will survive in the real world. Its retirement wasn't a failure of design. It was a collision between innovation and the economics of air travel. And that's why, decades later, no supersonic jet has ever truly matched it. Thanks for watching. If this breakdown gave you a new perspective on Concorde or just reminded you why it mattered, Leave a comment, drop a like, and subscribe for more deep dives like this. See you in the next one.